it's been quite a summer as we've looked at the uh, book of Philippians. This is the last section. This is it. We're, at, we're coming through it. And I've got to tell you, I've really, I've always loved the book of Philippians, but I've seen it in a whole new light going into it like we have. As in all of Paul's letters, he always starts with a greeting, and then there's a teaching. There's a therefore, because of what I've just taught, then there's a whole section on application, and then there's the goodbye. We're in the very last part of the application today. There's not, there's not a lot of doctrine. There's not a lot of heavy stuff. It's, it's very practical things that we're going to look at. We know Paul wrote Philippians as one of the four prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And written, we know it's written about 61 to 63 AD. Now, the church at Philippi had sent a gift. Remember the rabbit that was up here? <laughs> I'm not going to lose that image for a while, I think. Um, and no, I did not know he was coming out dressed as a rabbit, so I, <laughs> that's fun. But the church at Philippi sent a gift. Now, you got to know all the way through, this church at Philippi had been sending gifts in the very early time, from the very beginning to Paul. They lost track of Paul for a while. And when they heard he was in, in prison or in house arrest, they started sending gifts. They sent another gift. That's who they are. As we look at this book... The key word's joy. It's used over 20 times in a variety of words like rejoice or joy. The book is about, if you can imagine, a man who is chained to a soldier is writing a book about joy to his friends. He's writing to a church where there's conflict in the church between two leaders, yet he's writing about joy. So on this sermon, this last word, I want to try to talk about what's the one thing you need to know. <laughs> what is Paul's point in this whole book? And that's what we're going to try to get to today. <coughs> and to do that, let us go to chapter 4. I'll be in verse 10. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn along with me. <coughs> or excuse me, um, as we go forward. Starts verse 10 with this. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Okay. He looks at what the, this gift that the Philippians has given to him as, as a joy. It's warmed his heart. Indeed, you were concerned but had no opportunity to show it. Now, moving on to 11. I am not saying this because I am in need. Now, I need to tell you something. He was in need. When you're in house arrest at this time, when the Romans, he, was, he, had, they had, he had to rent a house. He had to supply his own food. Sure, he was in need. But what Paul focuses on is not the need, but on the God who supplies his need. I need to say that to you. So he's making a point. He's still teaching, even though this is the very end of the letter. He says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Going on to 12, he says, I know what it's like to be in need. Of course he does. He knows it right now. And I know what it's like to have plenty. If you read Paul's life, he grew up in pri going to private schools. He went to the best, the best colleges. He came to study in Jerusalem as a Pharisee under the, at the feet of a, a great rabbi named Hillel. He knows what it's like to be on top and at the bottom. He knows that. I have learned the secret. This is all, the one thing. What's the secret? We all want to know, what's the secret? I could fill in the blanket. What's the secret to weight loss? What's the secret to, you know, retiring 20 years early? What's the secret? You know, come on. We all know these things. I get them all over the internet. What's the secret, though, of being content? I have never seen that in all my postings, or in all the postings I've read on the internet. What's the secret of being content in any and every situation, okay? He tells us, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, it's in 13 if we go there. 
I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, I need to say something to you. When I first learned this verse, I started learning it when I was back in college. You may not believe this, but when I was uh, significantly younger, I used to run a lot. And I, at, 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 when I was in college, I remember at my senior year, uh, that where I was living, they needed uh, the, they had a five-man team for an intramural, intramural event, and the fifth person got sick and couldn't do it, and they, they looked for some likely candidate, and I, they for some reason chose me. They knew I ran. But what they didn't know, I hadn't run for a while, like six months. <laughs> and he said, can you run? And me and my young pride said, sure, I can do this 10K without any warm-up or practice. I, I, it was a memorable experience. <laughs> I remember about two-thirds of the way through, and I like to run. Okay, I'm one of those crazy people. I like to run, but I hit a wall. I didn't think I'd breathe anymore after this. <laughs> and the only thing I could think of was this verse. And I, I just clamped on this verse with every step I can do. All things to Christ who gives me strength. Now, I need to tell you, my motives were not pure. I didn't want to be last. I was on. I wanted to finish way up in the packs, you know, for my team's sake and everything else. And I kept saying it and saying it. And I did get across the finish line, and then I took a little rest. Um, but that's not the point of this verse. I didn't know that then, and God still honored me. He He helped me. But that's not. A lot of people see this verse as how I become a super Christian. If I just say this verse, I'm going to be super powerful. I have, I'm going to have super whatever I need to do whatever I have to do. But that's not what this verse is about. That's not what Paul intended it to be. When he says, I can do all this or even everything, he's referring back to what he just talked about. I can deal with the good stuff and the bad stuff. I can deal with it all. Whatever I'm facing, no matter what it is, I can deal with everything. What, how? Through him. Literally, it says, in him. What he's saying, in him, I can deal with any circumstance. And I mean any circumstance. Who gives me strength. Do you realize this is the only place I'm aware of that God says, I'm going to give you the strength you need to face what you have to face. It's not love. It's not grace. It's not mercy. He says, I know you need strength. I'm going to give it to you. I can do all this through the one who gives me strength. This was written by a man who knows what it's like to need God's strength and has received it. He has been strengthened so he could face what he has to face, without a doubt. Now he goes on and says, yet I, it was good of you to share in my troubles. And going on. And he says, moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days, you know, this just explains, in the early days you helped me at every point after I, I came to you. They did, they sent gifts to, they're the only church that sent gifts to Paul all the way through. And going on to the next verse, uh, go to 16 for me. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. But now I want to look at the gift a second. Look at 17. Not that I desire your gifts. You need to understand what Paul's saying here. The gifts are necessary. They're helpful. But he's not focusing on the gifts. What he says is what I desire is more, is that more be credited to your account. In other words, he's saying I'm more excited to see you being a giver than just receiving your gift. He says, I, I see God moving in givers. That's who we're supposed to be. We're givers. We serve a God who's, who's a giving God. When I see you still giving after all this time, 
It gets me excited. I appreciate the gift, but I'm more interested in your heart, in your mind, and who you are. And when I see you giving like this, that's a testimony to me that God's still working in you. It's not natural to be givers. Can I tell you that? Going on to 18. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I'm amply supplied now that I received the gift you sent me. Now look what he says here, this last statement. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. I don't know if you realize that. That's found throughout the Old Testament as a description of a sacrifice, particularly a large sacrifice taken to the temple. This is what people would have said. I pray my gift is a a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. We're supposed to have a pleasing fragrance in the world. We're supposed to smell pretty. Can I tell you the world does not smell good when Christians smell bad? I need to say that to you. I take it very personally when a pastor falls or something happens in a church, I deal with those things a lot. It breaks my heart, but I also know something. That smell lingers there. And it's hard to clean up. Our gift is meant to be a, a, a pleasing smell to God. Now, it's not just found in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament as well. Go ahead and go to that next slide for me. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Take, listen to this. This is another of one of Paul's letters. He says, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly beloved children. Now let's go to the second part. And walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Christ himself, himself gave, he gave himself as an offering, a gift, a gift for us. And he, it was his joy to give himself up for us. That's what Paul's talking about in here. He gave himself as a fragrant offering, as a sacrifice to God, a free gift. Going on. And now Paul can say something here which is incredible. Remember, Paul is writing. It's been 12, maybe 10, 15 years since the church was founded in Philippi. Paul has been through jail. He's been in jail. He's been through shipwrecks. He's had snake bites. He has been beaten. He has had incredible responses to his preaching. He's seen mountains move by his preaching. He has seen miracles. He has seen all kinds of good and bad. And out of that, he says this, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. We have a God who meets our needs, not our wants. I have been praying for a convertible. I have a red one in mine out there. Guess what? That's a want. I trust my God to know what I need. Paul has found that he has a God he can trust, that he knows will give him what he needs as he needs it. The first time he was in Philippi, remember he was chained and they're singing at night. You can read about this in Acts People were praying, and there was an earthquake, and his chains fell off, and they praised God. Now, 10, 15 years later, he's in, he's in a similar situation, chained to a guard. He's still praising God, but the chains haven't fallen off, and he's still get, praising God. Because he has found whether a miracle whether he's still in jail, chained to a soldier, he can praise God because God has met every need he had. <clears throat> All to his glory in Christ Jesus. To God our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the next section is, is this goodbye part. You know, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. Note that one thing about Paul, he never does this stuff alone. 
It takes a church. It takes the body to be the body of Christ. And I think you need to see this in Paul's writing. Go on to 22, please. (coughs) All God's people here send you greeting. Especially those who belong to Caesar's household. This is one of the clues that most people believe that uh, Paul was in Rome in in house arrest when this was written. This is when Nero was was um, was uh, Caesar, Nero, who would take Christians, dip them in stuff, and hang them up in his garden and light them for an evening stroll. I mean, that's the kind of man he was. And yet, God had moved to such an extent. Paul is giving testimony. There are Christians in Caesar's household. Can God go anywhere? Yes. Do you know that's what Paul is saying here? We have a God that can break through any wall, any door. Now, going on, and he ends with this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You know, as I look at all that, what does this mean? If you'll go to the next slide for me, Mike. I would say Philippians is about this one thing. I am in Christ. That's what Paul's saying. Above everything else, I want you to know something. I am in Christ. It's in the present tense. It's not something I did 30 years ago, 10 years ago. It means right now, I am daily living in Christ. I am in him. I am. All the way through Paul's writing, he says this over and over. I am in Christ. I am in Jesus. I am in him. And what he means by that, I can trust him to meet my needs. I can trust him. What He'll know whatever's best, whether I'm freed or I'm in chains. doesn't matter. I can trust him in every situation that he is enough. That's what he wants the Philippians to know. Conflict, I'm in Christ. He will help us settle it if we go to him. And what he's challenging us all to do is to consider something here. Do you believe in the goodness of God? Do you believe in a God that loves you, that that his compassion is more than you can understand, that we have a blessed assurance of a God who died for you? Do you know that? Do you understand that? That's what Paul is saying. The reason I can say I am in Christ is because I know... I know this one and how much he loves me. And I put myself in his hands because of that. As we go to a a time of reflection now, I've asked the team here to sing a song. It's called The Goodness of God. I want you all to remain seated. I want you to watch the word and reflect. Do you know this God? So that you can say, like Paul, I am in Christ. I'm in Christ because I know that he's the God who loves me. His goodness is more than I understand. His mercy is more than I deserve. His compassion is daily. It's new every morning. All the way through scripture, that is the singular theme that we have this kind of God who wants to work in our lives. I want us to reflect as this song is heard. May we prepare ourselves now.